Okay, uh, so today let us continue our discussion of uh, trying to write down the tight binding Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So, if you recall uh, in the uh, last class I started off with this uh, example in terms of position and momentum uh, description that is more familiar to us. So, the idea is that you have a crystal where the atoms are located at this uh, capital letter R n. So, these are the locations of all the atoms. Now, an electron moving in such a crystal will have a Hamiltonian which is specific to that particular atom. So, that means if uh, so, R, R is the position of the electron inside the crystal, R minus R n is the position of the electron relative to that particular atom at R n. So, if you are talking only about that particular atom at R n then the Hamiltonian of the electron will be uh, dependent on the distance of the electron from that particular atom which is R minus R n. But it will also clearly depend upon the momentum of the electron which is uh, an operator which is minus i h bar grad r. So, uh, so this is for uh, electron which is uh, experiencing forces from that particular atom. So, then you have to add up over all the atoms. But then you see the point is that uh, it is not true that uh, only uh, so that means that uh, the potential energy of an electron is not necessarily only due to that particular atom. So, that there will be other other atoms that will also exert forces on this particular electron. So, the point is that you should also take into account the possibility that uh, there are additional potential energies that are not part of this right. So, it is not always that you can express the uh, potential energy as the sum of uh, something due to this particular atom and then that atom and then you it is just a linear sum of that. So, there may be something additional over and above that. So, that is what we call delta u of r ok. So, that if you read this sentence it says delta u of r ensures that the full Hamiltonian is not merely a sum of disjoint contributions from isolated atoms. So, you see whatever it is you can now write the second quanta is Hamiltonian in terms of creation and annihilation operator because we have it in terms of position and momentum. So, now what we did was we said that uh, let us uh, assume that uh, this particular Hamiltonian has a set of complete uh, eigenstates labeled by phi L. So, L is uh, some, uh, some kind of a shorthand for the orbitals. So, uh, so now uh, the idea is that uh, you can uh, then having written down for one atom you can then construct uh, for uh, all the atoms put together because then for all the atoms put together the Hamiltonian becomes specially periodic uh, where the period is determined by the lattice vector R n. So, that means uh, it obeys Bloch's theorem. So, that means the wave functions need not be periodic, but they are related to periodic functions. So, uh, so bottom line is that you can then uh, rewrite uh, your uh, wave functions of the combined Hamiltonian of all the atoms put together in terms of these block states. And we said that uh, these block states because the tight binding method assumes that uh, the wave functions of an electron for a particular atom are strongly localized near that particular atom. So, that is what tight binding means. So, tight binding means that the electron is typically tightly bound to an, a given atom. So, then it can occasionally uh, there is a small probability that it can then hop to the neighboring one. So, that is the mental picture that we have. So, now you see the second quantized uh, annihilation operator can always be so because now we have a complete uh, basis here in terms of the block states which are then in turn constructed from the orbitals of the individual atom wave functions. So, having done that uh, we can now re-express the annihilation operator in terms of the block states. So, when you do that you, you encounter this operator. So, this operator basically tells you that uh, there is a, a linear combination of uh, the uh, annihilation operator written in terms of the momentum states uh, 
which rather has the interpretation of being the coefficient of that particular corresponding atom's annihilation operator. So, you see this is the annihilation operator for an electron in the entire crystal, but this after having summed over k, so once you sum over k, the free labels are n and l. So, what that means is basically this, this particular summation is basically this, so which represents uh, the uh, annihilation of an electron at the atom labeled by R n. So, the, that means it represents the annihilation of an electron uh, at the atom labeled by R n uh, and being present in the orbital labeled by s. So, that means this operator what it does is it, uh, it annihilates that specific electron which happens to belong to uh, the atom labeled by R n. So, there is an atom sitting at R n and there is a there are electrons associated with that. So, the electron that is in orbital L is being annihilated ok and then that to that specific L. So, this kind of uniquely pins down the electron because once you uh, so, so, then there is a spin projection also. So, you have a spin projection, you have the orbital index. So, that orbital can be you know some say if you are thinking of hydrogen atom it will be n l and m uh, that means it will be principal or orbital angular angular i mean orbital quantum number principal quantum number and the magnetic quantum number so that l can be a shorthand for three numbers like n l and m but i have just written n l does not mean it is that uh, only that orbital quantum number l is shorthand for any discrete set of indices that uniquely and completely specifies the orbital that is we are thinking of ok. So, it is not necessarily one number, it can be a bunch of numbers. So, basically uh, that that L put together with the spin projection sigma which is up or down together with n which is the, the nth atom at which you are annihilating the electron, you see uniquely specifies uh, what it means to annihilate an electron with those qualities or so with those properties. So, having said that now we can also uh, ask the inverse question. So, uh, suppose I want to know how to annihilate an electron with momentum k right. So, then how would you do that? So, I would simply invert this relation. So, you see any any transform has no value unless I know how to invert it also. So, inversion is extremely critical. So, no transform is useful unless you know how to invert. So, the claim is that the way to invert this transform is to do this. So, you can easily convince yourself this is correct by uh, you know just take uh, see you have this formula here in uh, change this k to k dash because then it will become a dummy index where you are summing over then insert this formula here right and then you sum over uh, n you will get this result ok. So, you can see that this is an identity. So, this tells you how to annihilate an electron with momentum k with spin projection sigma ok. So, bottom line is that uh, uh, so, this is I just pointed this out that you can do this, but now let us get back to this. So, this c uh, sigma r which uh, annihilates an electron at some point r in the entire crystal can now be written in terms of the uh, basis functions of the individual atoms times uh, a localized annihilation operator. That means, an uh, annihilation which annihilates an electron in a particular atom in a certain orbital with a certain spin projection ok. So, now uh, the claim is that uh, if uh, I in impose. So, now I want to uh, understand the commutation rules obeyed by that means, I want to ensure that the anti commutation rules for the electrons are properly obeyed. So, that is guaranteed because we are going to assume that the basis functions are orthonormal and complete. So, if the basis functions phi l are orthonormal and complete uh, that is both necessary and sufficient to ensure the uh, fermion commutation rules of these annihilation operators. So, we can just go ahead and impose these commutation rules and uh, these are the s commutators. Remember that uh, if s is minus 1 
a commutator b with a uh, s equal to minus 1 means it is a b plus b a right otherwise it is a b minus b a for bosons. So, uh, so bottom line is that uh, this is uh, we are going to impose this suppose you impose this then uh, you can convince yourself that uh, the uh, s anti commutation rules for the fermions are correctly given as uh, being proportional to the Dirac delta function ok. So, you can choose to divide by 1 by square root of n if you do not want this n sitting there ok. You can redefine your sigma with a 1 by square root of n maybe that we should have done that. So, if, if I had defined it in terms of 1 by square root of n this would not have come. So, then it would be clearly uh, anti commutation of c c dagger is exactly Dirac delta. You see the that is why it is uh, you might think that uh, I am being a bit uh, sloppy, but uh, it is not sloppiness if I tell you how to do the forward transform and the inverse transform both. So, when I do both and things are mutually consistent and, and if I insert one into the other if it leads to an identity then it is certainly not sloppy because it is absolutely rigorously correct. It becomes sloppy only if I, I show you one only the forward transform and then I do not tell you what the reverse is and then I just proceed. Then it becomes ambiguous because then somebody will pick up some other convention from some other book and it will lead to an inconsistency. But here that is the reason why I have taken the trouble to show you both the forward transform and the inverse transform so that the chances of me uh, going wrong are absolutely 0. All right, so uh, so the point is that uh, now we can go ahead and uh, calculate uh, the Hamiltonian, the second quantized form, namely this. So for that, uh, I have to first uh, understand how the total Hamiltonian for all the atoms put together uh, acts on the uh, annihilation operator for the electrons in the crystal. So if this H total acting on the uh, block states gives you the energy of uh, uh, energy of the electron in the crystal. So, which depends on the momentum and then notice that I have then uh, re expressed the uh, uh, block states in terms of the uh, original orbitals and I have used the fact that it is tightly bound. So, I have replaced R by R n here and so on and so forth. So, then I end up with this result. Then uh, I use the completeness orthonormality and then I, I do this integral uh, ok. So, once I do this integral, so I will I will leave you to verify some of these steps on your own because uh, it is really pointless for me to explain all the steps because it is also your responsibility to ensure that you are following all the steps because you see quite a number of steps are displayed and it is really important for you to fill in the small remaining number of steps. So, the bottom line is that uh, once you integrate you end up with this uh, new interpretation for the Hamiltonian of the entire crystal. So, what is this interpretation? You see it has this interpretation that uh, it is it is given by uh, so, so the total energy of the system. So, we will come to that delta u later. So, remember it is not really still the total energy because there is a delta u that talks about uh, the extra you know it is not merely a disjoint sum of the Hamiltonians from all the different atoms there could be something extra. But uh, the uh, analysis of that extra term is also very analogous to what I have already done here because uh, even the extra term is also going to be spatially periodic because after all uh, it has to represent uh, an electron moving in a periodic crystal. So, because anything that is periodic will have a very similar mathematical uh, consequence ok. So, uh, bottom line is that uh, as far as the term that corresponds to the total energy of the atoms put together is concerned it can certainly be written in this way. And what is this way? So, what does it say? So, it basically says that the energy of the um, electrons, the total energy of all the electrons of all the atoms when you add them all up, uh, it is going to consist of. So, it, it, it amounts to annihilating an electron uh, 
at some other location R n dash okay, and then creating it at some other location R n and then you multiply that. So, that means that when you do that you see so, so what, what this is doing is the, the Hamiltonian of the system now in this language corresponds to annihilating an electron which belongs to some atom sitting at R n dash. Okay. And so that means you remove an electron from an atom that is sitting at R n dash and then you insert that electron into an atom that is sitting at R n. So, that is pretty much what this says. So, it says that uh, it amounts to doing that and there is an energy uh, cost or gain or whatever it is depending on the sign associated with doing that and that energy is determined by or we have taken that to be W of R n minus R n dash because clearly it depends on the distance between the two atoms. So, so you can see already here that it has this interpretation of hopping. So, what was uh, originally a Hamiltonian uh, consisting of uh, uh, you know position and momentum operator. So, remember there was this H A T which was the starting point. So, this had position and momentum. So, the position and momentum description has given way to this hopping description. So, now we have uh, re-expressed the entire Hamiltonian in terms of uh, processes that correspond to hopping. So, the kinetic energy of the system uh, in some sense now uh, represents the hopping of an electron from one atom to another. Okay. So, the idea is that, so we are going to assume that this W n is uh, sharply peaked at 0. So, that means W 0 is the maximum. So, it is sharply peaked uh, W r will be sharply peaked at r equal to 0. Okay. So, if that is the case then clearly uh, n dash equals n is the dominant contribution, but that is uninteresting because that corresponds to the total number of particles. Okay. So, the interesting term comes from the next term. So, the next most important contribution to this summation comes when R n is R n dash is not close uh, not equal to R n, but is as close to R n as possible. So, that is called the nearest neighbor. So, we are going to assume therefore, that the most dominant contribution which is not proportional to an identity comes from uh, the, the nearest neighbors. So, that means the n dash is uh, a nearest neighbor to n. So, that means n is equal to n dash plus delta where delta is the distance between nearest neighbors. So, remember I told you that already in one dimension there are two nearest neighbors one to the left one to the right. So, if this is the, your atom of interest its nearest neighbor there is one to the left one to the right. So, in two dimension it can be even more uh, interesting. So, that means you can have many nearest neighbors. So, the whole idea is that whatever it is that you have to sum over all the nearest neighbors. So, you have to sum over the, so we are going to assume that n is n dash plus delta and then you sum over all the nearest neighbor then you sum over all n dash and then you of course, sum over the orbitals and the spin projections. So, you see uh, it so happens that uh, even the extra term that we had omitted till now that means that what is that extra term basically it corresponds to the possibly including pro the possibility that the energy of the electron may not be merely a disjoint sum of the energy of uh, all the individual atoms it can be due to something else. So, I mean it can be uh, due to all the atoms put together can uh, you know contribute to the energy or the potential energy of the electron in a different way. So, even if that is the case you will see that it similarly leads to the same type of hopping. Okay. So, if you uh, redo the analysis for the delta u it also leads to hopping. So, bottom line is this hopping uh, interpretation is extremely generic and uh, natural uh, when you re-express your Hamiltonian in, which was originally in terms of position and momentum you re-express it in terms of uh, the tight binding picture. So, here the assumption is that 
each electron is tightly bound to a given atom. So, that means the, the all the wave functions sharply peaked around the atoms and so the natural description is in terms of the, so the kinetic motion through the crystal is possible only through this mechanism of hopping. So, that, that to hopping into the, to the nearest neighbors. So, there is a small chance that an atom, uh, I mean electron tied to a certain atom will kind of quantum mechanically tunnel through and cross the barrier and reach the neighboring atom and the chances that it will go further are very slim. So, that is the whole idea about uh, when you are talking about hopping uh, of nearest neighbors. So, now uh, we had restricted ourselves only to uh, studying uh, atom, I mean electrons that do not interact with each other, they only interact with their atoms. So, that means they interact with the positive charges, they do not interact with each other. But we can also include the idea that they interact with each other. So, how do you do that? You uh, simply introduce this uh, type of two body interaction term. So, usually if the charged particles you expect this to be the Coulomb term that is E squared by R types. So, uh, but whatever it is you can uh, re-express. So, just like we did uh, with the hopping, the kinetic term, we can re-express this in terms of the block states, the block wave functions and uh, rewrite this whole thing in terms of the block states. So, so the idea is that uh, you see uh, again it is a lot of tedious algebra and I will allow you to uh, go over the details. So, the idea is that you uh, rewrite this in terms of the dense, so it is a density density interaction. Okay. So, the density now can be written in terms of the orbitals. So, in terms of creating and annihilating electrons that are sitting in different orbitals. So, here uh, clearly you are going to be uh, because it you see you are creating and annihilating uh, so, so at the same point in space. So, that is C dagger R C R. Okay. So, so those things are same so that the dominant terms will already be. So, you see remember that we ignored the m dash equal to n dash term in the case of uh, hopping because that led to a trivial uh, additive term proportional to the total number of particles, but here it is not going to do that. So, it is it is not going to trivially lead to so that that itself will contribute. So, so we can actually uh, first try out the uh, most obvious dominant uh, contribution where m dash is equal to n dash. Okay. So, in the case of hopping that led to a trivial additive constant which was uninteresting but here it will not lead to something, it will it will not be very trivial. So, the idea is that you re-express your uh, rho q which is your Fourier transform density in terms of uh, these uh, integrals which involve the overlap between the orbitals L and L dash okay, of this particular atom. So, the idea is that, uh, so when you do that uh, you get uh, this sort of uh, I mean, so, so not surprisingly you will of course be forced to conclude these orbitals also have to be equal. I could have easily assumed that right from the start, but then I have made it slightly more general by not assuming that. So, bottom line is that uh, you see when you rewrite this in terms of uh, these operators, you will end up uh, getting this, this sort of an idea. So, that means you will get this result. So, what this implies is that you are actually, so this uh, this q factor peaks at r n minus r n dash equals r n double dash. So, I know that there is a whole lot of uh, unnecessary seemingly unnecessary notation here, it is just that I, I want to get to this result as quickly as possible and perhaps I am not doing a very good job. But but you see it, this is uh, this procedure is necessary because remember that originally the description is in terms of position and momentum operators. So, I have to gradually transform those those that description so that I end up with uh, a description in terms of electrons hopping from a lattice point to another and not. Uh, so, the, the idea that an electron can reside in between two lattice points is meaningless in this tight binding picture. 
So, the electron is either at one lattice point or at some other lattice point. So, it, there it simply hops from one to the other. So, it, there is no concept of an electron being somewhere in between. So, the idea is that we have to arrive at that sort of a picture systematically from because that picture is a priori not obvious. So, if you look at space as a continuous uh, set of points, then uh, there is no reason to believe that an electron can be somewhere in between two lattice points. But now, uh, given that it, so how do we arrive at the lattice description from a continuum description is the fundamental question we are trying to address. So, it is achieved through a series of approximations. So, the most important of them being that the tight binding approximation. That means, an electron is tightly bound to a given atom and it occasionally hops. So, th there is a small probability for it to tunnel through and reach the other atom. So, if you accept that sort of a progression of ideas, then you can easily convince yourself that the interaction between electrons. So, the potential energy between the, in so the Coulomb potential energy for example, can be rewritten in terms of uh, a certain integral. So, that means it can be re-expressed in terms of an integral over the, um, so you can re-express it. So, this is your w q. So, that is an, an overlap between the orbitals if you like. So, it tells you uh, how the, uh, the ener what is the energy cost to putting one electron on top of the other. So, that is pretty much what this is. So, so basically uh, this u is therefore, that energy cost to putting one electron on top of the other. So, so the idea is that here this is the number of uh, electrons sitting at position i. So, that means, is the number of electrons sitting at atom which is located at some location i. Okay. So, this is the number of electrons. So, n i sigma is the number of electrons uh, at atom located at i. So, and that electron has a spin projection sigma. So, that means, so it can be either up or down. So, the, what this is saying is that this potential energy, the Coulomb potential energy of all the electrons put together now has this new interpretation in the tight binding picture and what is that new interpretation? The new interpretation is that that potential energy is simply the uh, energy cost is the sum of all the energy cost to putting uh, one electron on top of another in a given atom summed over all atoms. So, I forgot to sum over i. So, that summation over i is implied. Okay. So, you have to sum over i also. So, summed over all i's. Okay. So, that is the whole idea. So, that you see you might think that why did I. So, finally, the interpretation is that you uh, see because you cannot put one uh, two electrons with the same spin on top of another. Uh, that is uh, you know that that violates Pauli principle. So, strictly speaking you should only include this term. So, mathematically you might think that why is that because here sigma dash equals sigma is also possible because here finally I am saying that sigma dash equals minus sigma is the only one you have to include. So, uh, it is possible uh, I mean mathematically also you can see that uh, so uh, if I put sigma dash equals sigma this will become n i sigma squared, but then remember n i is either 0 or 1, n i sigma is either 0 or 1. So, because what is n i sigma? It is the number of electrons at position i with spin projection sigma. So, that is clearly either 0 or 1. So, uh, so in that case, uh, this is uh, n i sigma itself. And I, so, if 0 square, if, if some number is either 0 or 1, its square is also either 0 or 1. So, that means n i sigma squared is n i sigma. So, if that is the case, then uh, if sigma dash equals sigma, it will become n i sigma squared, which is n i sigma. But then when you sum over all i and sigma, you will get uh, 
uh, you will basically get uh, total number of particles which is an uninteresting constant. So, therefore, the only interesting situation is when you have one uh, spin which is up and one which is down sitting on top of each other. So, that is the dominant contribution to the uh, electron electron interaction in a tight binding picture. So, the bottom line is that the end uh, description is that you see if you have a crystal. So, you have a bunch of uh, uh, positive charges sitting at some regular lattice locations and then you have bunch of electrons which are uh, trying to roam around that crystal. So, now two things happen one is that there will be a, a Hamiltonian. So, the Hamiltonian description of those electrons can be attributed or described in the following way. One contribution will come from the atoms. Uh, so, each atom will contribute a certain Hamiltonian to that electron. So, that means that there will be a Hamiltonian associated with the interaction of the of an electron with the positive charge sitting at some particular location in the lattice. So, and then summed over all such lattice points. So, that is one contribution. So, the other contribution will come uh, due to some extra potential energy that may be over and above that. So, it may not be as, so there could be some residual contributions that is not attributable to a disjoint sum of the uh, contribution from all the atoms sitting separately. So, there will be a delta u contribution there. But then both these contributions put together in the tight binding picture can simply be thought of as a hopping term. So, that means, so, so the contribution to the uh, Hamiltonian due to the individual atoms, the, so that means the electrons interacting with all the different positive charges uh, is simply lumped and uh, described in, in the tight binding picture as a hopping term. So, that means that an electron can hop from one lattice point to its neighbor. Okay. So, then there is an energy cost associated with that hopping which we call as T. So, that is the tight binding description of an electron in a lattice. So, but then uh, then electron will also interact because it is a charged particle it can they can mutually repel. So, how do you describe that? So, remember that in the tight binding picture an electron is either at one lattice point or at some other lattice point and it is meaningless to talk about some electron being somewhere in between. So, the idea is that when you want to describe a, uh, the repulsion between electrons, so naturally it will be uh, sensible only if one electron is sitting on top of another. So, that will be the dominant contribution. So, one electron is at some atom, the other electron is on the same atom. So, then there will be an energy cost associated with that because that is when the repulsion will be the strongest. right? So, you will have to include that. So, that is what this is. So, but then one electron cannot sit on top of another unless one of them is up spin, the other is down spin. Okay? So, that is the tight binding approach in the nearest neighbor hopping and the dominant contribution to the uh, Coulomb interaction. So, but then uh, there are other uh, possibilities the, so that, so this is the, uh, although this is the dominant contribution, it is also important to include a sub dominant contribution and see if they change the results qualitatively. because. Uh, it is possible that there are some effects that uh, vanish identically because of these stringent assumptions and inclusion of sub dominant contributions may actually make a quantity which is uh, 0 or suddenly non 0. See if the if inclusion of sub dominant contributions uh, change a non 0 quantity slightly uh, that is uninteresting. So, you might as well not consider the sub dominant contributions. So, the interesting situations in physics are when the dominant contribution produces a trivial result. So, that means there is some physical quantity which is identically 0 if you uh, consider a point of view uh, a certain set of approximations. So, now uh, then it becomes extremely critical for you to include the things that you have thrown away especially the, the leading things that you have thrown away 
So, you put it back into your uh, analysis then the quantity that was actually identically 0 because of that oversimplifying uh, assumptions are now going to be non-zero. So, that is the reason why it is also important to uh, consider uh, the possibility that you uh, those consider those possibilities. So, that means in addition to this, so the remember what I told you about this angular brackets angular bracket i j is a standard notation in tight binding picture what it means is i and j are nearest neighbors. So, it is also important to consider the next nearest neighbor and make sure that that does not change anything qualitatively. So, that is also frequently done. So, and similarly here also uh, you have to make sure that not only you consider coulomb repulsion for electron sitting on the same atom one is up one is down but you should also consider the possibility that an electron sitting on neighboring atoms will also have a coulomb repulsion, but of um, significantly less in magnitude, but maybe uh, inclusion of that uh, might change some results qualitatively. So, we should be wary of those possibilities as well. So, which is why I have done that. So, uh, strictly speaking I should have done uh, for the hopping also I should have run minus T dash. So, the so the next nearest neighbor, so the nearest neighbor is uh, angular bracket i j, next nearest neighbor standard notation is 2 angular brackets. So, that means, it is uh, one removed from the other. Okay. So, I should have done included that also. So, there will be 4 terms t i j, uh, well t, t i j can be thought of as just t typically. So, then there is a t and a t dash for the next nearest. So, the nearest neighbor hopping is t that is the amplitude, t dash is the next nearest neighbor amplitude. So, the uh, repulsion between uh, electrons sitting on the same lattice point is u and uh, the repulsion on neighboring lattice points is v. So, this is basically, so this is by the way this is the famous Hubbard model. Okay, so, this is the famous Hubbard model of solid state physics. Okay. So, this is uh, the famous Hubbard model and this is called the extended Hubbard model. So, uh, the point is that uh, if uh, your lattice is in one dimension you can actually solve for the uh, many properties of this Hubbard model in one dimension exactly uh, using a technique called Bethe ansatz, which I will not be discussing in this course. So, this course is more about exposing you to the interesting models of solid state physics. It is not about teaching you how to solve those models, which are somewhat technical and uh, they require a lot of effort. So, it is not suitable to teach in a course, it is best for self learning, but I am uh, offering this course just to alert you to the basics. So, that means, I am making you aware of the existence of all these models that are worth solving. So, it is for you to find out how they are solved in practice. So, in one dimension they are typically solved using something called Bethe ansatz. And there are other techniques called bosonization, which are also important, which I am going to discuss by the way in this course towards the end. Okay. But Bethe ansatz is uh, also typically used in one dimension. So, just to summarize, uh, I have successfully hopefully convinced you that uh, it is possible to simplify the description of the motion of an electron in a crystal through this tight binding picture. So, that means, through the tight binding picture you replace this uh, continuum description, replace it with a lattice description. So, that means, in a lattice description an electron does not have an option of being uh, somewhere uh, wherever it wants to be. It has to be either sitting on one atom or the next atom or the other atom. It does not have a choice of being somewhere in between. So, the thing is the kinetic motion comes about by when an electron tunnels through and reaches the neighboring atom. right? So, and the coulomb interaction between electron comes as if one electron is sitting with up spin on one atom, an electron another can come only if it has down spin and if it sits on that atom, 
they will repel with some fixed energy called u. So, this description is called the tight binding description and it enormously simplifies uh, the you know the description of the motion of electrons in, in a solid in a crystalline solid. And uh, a lot of effort has been made to understand these simplified models of electrons in a crystalline solid and uh, a lot is known, a lot is also not known especially in more than one dimension. So, I will stop here and in the next class I will uh, describe some variants of this uh, Hubbard model, there are something called the Anderson lattice model and so on. Then I will explain to you what sort of uh, quantities are worth calculating using this tight binding picture. So, there are some quantities called order parameters that are interesting which you have to calculate. So, and uh, the next section will uh, be devoted to understanding uh, how to uh, certain limiting cases of the Hubbard model will describe magnetism. So, I will be describing, I will show you how the models of magnetism that you might be familiar with can be systematically derived as certain limiting cases of the Hubbard model. So, that will be a few classes down the road. Okay, so thanks for listening to me, hope to see you in the next class, thank you.